Today we're going to be finishing 11.1 .1, where we're solving an equation by completing the square. So if you remember last video, we did completing the square kind of on its own. Um, but now we're going to be actually solving equations using this method. It's a super important method to know. You're going to use it in this class. You're going to use it in the next class. And if you continue, if you have further math, you're probably going to use this method. So it's really worth learning and getting comfortable with. So you can see we give you these um, few steps here. Isolate the constant on one side. Make sure that the coefficient in front of the squared term is 1. Um, it's always got to be 1. It can't be another number. It's not. Divide every term on both sides of the equation by this coefficient. Take half of the coefficient of the x term and square it. Add this result to both sides of the equation. So again, we did this part already. This half of it we did in the last video where we were doing complete and square. Now it says add this result to both sides of the equation. And that's because we have to keep this equation balanced, right? We talk about an equation being like a scale. If I add something to the left side, it means I have to add it to the right side. Then you factor the side containing the variables as a perfect square trinomial. So it's generally going to be the left side of the equation you will factor and then solve the resulting equation using the square root property, which we learned in an earlier section. Okay, so the first thing that we want to do is isolate the constant on one side, right? So if you look at number one, it's already done. We already have five by itself on the side. Everything on the left side of the equation has an X. That's what we are looking for. So number two says make sure the coefficient in front of the squared term is one. If you look at our x squared, there's nothing there, so we just have the invisible one, so that's good. Three, now we get into the actual completing the square, and it says take half of the coefficient of the x term and square it. So when they say the x term, they're talking about the b term when we're saying ax squared plus bx plus c, right? So we're always using our b term for this part. So in our um, equation for number one, it's four. So we're going to take 4, and you can think of it as negative 4 if you want, um, divided by 2, which gives me a negative 2, and then I'm going to square this, and it is in parentheses, which will give me a positive 4. That's why I said you don't necessarily have to think about the um, sign for this part. So this is what we want to add to both sides is 4, right? So we're going to get x squared minus 4x plus 4 equals 5 plus 4. Okay, I have to add it to both sides again to keep my equation balanced. If I don't do that, it's going to be incorrect. Now I want to look first at this side, the left side, and factor this. We already know it's a perfect square trinomial. If we did our steps correctly, it should be a perfect square trinomial. So it's going to be x, it's going to take the sign of the b term, so minus, and then it's the number before you squared it, so it's 2 squared equals 5 plus 4 is 9, okay? So now we use the square root property to solve this equation because it's just x minus 2 squared, it's something squared equals 9. From here, we take the square root of the left side. We take the square root of the right side. Square root of something squared will cancel out, right? So I'm just left with x minus 2 equals plus or minus the square root of 9. Hopefully, you're getting comfortable with these square roots is 3. So then I solve for x plus 2 and plus 2. So I get x equals 2 plus or minus three. And I need to actually solve this and get a solution set of answers. So I say that X is equal to two plus three or X is equal to two minus three. Two plus three gives me five, two minus three gives me negative one. So my set is negative one and five. Okay, so it's kind of a lot of steps, but it's the same steps every time. So looking at number two, again, we want to isolate the, the constant on one side. So we're going to add 5 to both sides. That's the number one step at the top. So we get x squared minus 8x equals 5, right? And generally when I'm writing this, I like to leave a little blank here on the left side so that I remember that I know I'm going to have to add something over there. 
Now I want to make sure that the coefficient in front of the square term is 1. It is. There's nothing written there, so I know it's an invisible 1, so I'm good with that step. Step number 3 says take half of the coefficient of the x term or the b term and square it. So I'm going to take negative 8 divided by 2. I'm going to half it. Gives me a negative 4. And then I'm going to square that, which is going to give me a positive 16. Negative 4 times negative 4. So I get plus 16 on this side and plus 16 on this side. And that's the main reason that I have to do this, just to see what it is that I'm adding. Now, on the left side, I'm not as concerned with having the 16 because I want to factor it. I want to have x, the sine of the b term, and minus, and the number that I, was before I squared it. So 4 squared. 5 plus 16 gives me 21. Now I can go ahead and apply the square root property. Square root of the left side, square root of the right side, I get x minus 4, because these squares cancel, equals plus or minus, don't forget your plus or minus, 21, right? Solve for x, add 4 to both sides, x equals 4 plus or minus square root of 21. Now for this one, there's nothing you can do. The square root of 21 does not break down, you can't combine 4 and that, so your answer is just the set that contains 4 plus or minus the square root of 21. Okay? Okay, so looking at number 3, or number, yeah, number 3, so hopefully you're starting to get comfortable with those rules. The first rule was to isolate the constant on one side of the equation. So I want to take this, plus, this minus 3 and add it to both sides so that I get my stuff that is equal to or that has x's is equal to just the number that doesn't have x's, right? I have the x squared and the x on one side and the number on the other side. And I've already said I usually like to leave a little gap here so that I remember what it is I will be adding, right? The next step, though, says that my x squared term, my first term, has got to have a coefficient of 1. And this one does not. If it does not have a coefficient of 1, it means I have to divide by whatever number is out front and make it into 1. So 4 divided by 4 gives me just x squared. i got to divide 32 by 4, and I've got to divide 3 by 4. 32 divided by 4 is plus 8x plus some other number that we don't know yet equals 3 over 4. And I would not go to a fraction. You know, in general, my math lab does not like fractions, or does not like decimals, so just keep it a fraction. So I want to now look at my b term, right? My 8x, and say I want to take 8 divided by 2, which gives me 4. Square that, which gives me 16, is what I should be adding to both sides, okay? Left side works just like it has been. It's a perfect square trinomial. We can go ahead and factor it. We're going to write x, the, ter the sign of the b, plus, and the number before we squared it, 4 squared, equals, but now I have 3 over 4 plus 16. And this is where in class I would ask you, what do we need? We need an LCD, right? Since it's 3 fourths and 16, we're going to use 4 as the LCD, so we're going to multiply 16 by 4 over 4. So I get 3 over 4, right? I just rewrite that one down, plus 64 over 4, okay? Um, that's 16 over 1 times 4 over 4, so 16 times 4 and 1 times 4. Now they have the same denominator, and I can add the fractions. So I don't mess with the left side at this point. Just rewrite it down, combine like terms, 67 over 4. Now I want to apply the square root property, okay? Square root of each side, I get x plus 4 equals square root of 67 over the square root of 4. If you remember that you can break that up, please also don't forget your plus and minus. It's very easy to drop it at this point, so make sure that you get comfortable with that and you remember that, okay? Um, now you, you can minus your 4, but we also want to make sure that we simplify radicals. So this square root of 4 is actually going to turn into a 2. So I'm going to take 4 away from both sides, and I get x equals a negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 67 over 2. And we should be checking 67 to see if it has any perfect squares. 
and in this case it doesn't but it's something that you should always be checking for um, and there may be times with this type of problem where they want you to combine these two which would mean that you have to get an LCD with this negative four if you did that um, if you did that you'd have to multiply the negative four by a uh, two over two right which would give me a negative eight over two plus or minus the square root of 67 over two um, and then you would write this as x equals a negative 8 plus or minus square root of 67 over 2. So if the computer says something like your answer is correct but not in the correct form, it may want it as one fraction. It also may want you to break this up and write it as negative 8 plus square root of 67 divided by 2 and negative 8 minus square root of 67 over two. Sometimes math lab can be funny about that, so please make sure that you're paying attention to this. All right, so looking at number four, and again, following these same five steps, first thing that we want to do is isolate the constant, this plus four by itself on the other side, so minus four from the left side, minus four from the right side. I get three x squared plus four x plus some other number that I'm going to add to both sides equals a negative 4, right? Um, the next step, if you remember, is to check and see if the coefficient of the x squared term is 1. And this time again, it's not. So remember, like the last problem, we have to divide by that coefficient. And it will cancel out for this one. But we also have to divide all the rest of the terms. You don't have to divide the last one because there's actually nothing there right now. It's just a 0. It's just a placeholder. So I have x squared plus 4 over 3x plus some number that I want to add equals a negative 4 over 3. Okay, so now I need to take my b term like I did before and divide by 2. Okay, so I have 4 over 3 divided by 2. And this is where everybody freaks out and panics because now I have 4 over 3 divided by 2. I have a fraction divided by a number. Um, so please remember fraction operations. When this happens, if this happens, you're going to use keep, change, flip, right? So I'm going to keep my numerator fraction, 4 over 3, change to multiplication, and flip. This is technically 2 over 1. So I'm going to multiply by one half, right? Which kind of should hopefully make some logical sense to you. Because um, if I'm dividing by two, I'm halving something or I'm multiplying by a half. But you have to think about it. If you don't, you're going to mess up and you're probably going to get this wrong. So you're doing four over three. We're dividing by two, which means we're going to keep change flip. We're going to take four over three times one over two. You multiply this, you get four over six. And then... Don't forget you have to square it. You can simplify this first to 2 over 3. They're both divisible by 2. And then I'm going to square it. So I know right now, though, that this um, 2 over 3 will be my factor when I factor on the other side, right? When I square it, I get 4 over 9, right? So please make sure you're taking these steps one at a time, right? I'm going to do a little line like this to help you remember that this was separate um, and it will help you if you write it off to the side of your paper and you don't try to do it in the same spot where you're trying to do the rest of your calculations um, so we do 4 over 3 divided by 2 so 4 over 3 times 1 half gives me 4 4 times 1 and then 3 times 2 is 6 I simplify this divide each by 2 gives me 2 over 3 and then I square it when I square I square the top and the bottom so I get 4 over 9 so plus 4 over 9 on this side, and I'm also going to add 4 over 9 on this side. So going back to the left side is going to be factored. We have x. We use the sign from the b term plus, and then we use this number. Again, that was before we squared it. It's uglier this time. It's a fraction. That's okay. Equals a negative 4 over 3 plus 4 over 9. Right? This was what we had to start with, and then we added 4 over 9 to it. So again, we have to get an LCD. 
So we need between three and nine. Hopefully you're comfortable with this at this point, but you should be looking for nine as your LCD. So I'm gonna multiply this first fraction by three over three. Three times three would give me nine on the bottom. That's what I'm looking for. Just gonna write the left side down. Not gonna do anything with that yet. Equals a negative 12, four times three over nine plus four over nine, right? So X plus two thirds squared equals negative 12 plus four gives me a negative eight over nine, okay? Now I need to apply the square root property. Take the square root of the left side and the right side. This one cancels. And I am left with x plus 2 thirds equals plus or minus the square root of a negative 8 over the square root of 9. Okay, so now I'm going to simplify that radical on the left side. I'm going to have x plus two-thirds, remember that's a different problem, equals plus or minus uh, square root of nine, hopefully you're seeing is three, that's a perfect square, and then negative eight. Now we have to look at some of the stuff that we have covered uh, in previous sections, the simplifying radicals, the imaginary numbers, that kind of stuff. So we're gonna actually break it up into the square root of negative one times the square root of four times the square root of two. Four times two gives me eight, so that's where that comes from, and it's a negative eight, so I need that negative one um, to make my i. Left side is x plus two over three equals plus or minus two i radical two over three. Okay, I broke my square root of four into this two square root of negative one is my i, and then I have the square root of two brought down, okay? Minus two thirds from both sides, x equals a negative two thirds plus or minus two i radical two all over three, okay? And actually for this problem, I would stop here. I would not combine them because in general, always they want anything with an imaginary in A plus B I form. They want the real and the imaginary split up. They do not want them put together as one fraction. So one fraction is okay when the whole thing is real. But as soon as you get an imaginary part like this, you no longer want to put it as one fraction. If you do, my math lab will mark it wrong. So your answer is just negative two thirds plus or minus two i radical two all over three.